Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the Richard James Show on 17104, The Voice. Greetings and salutations, my friend. It's good to see you again. It's good to be seen again. And welcome to uh, the Richard James Show. I uh, feel so blessed to have the honor and the privilege uh, to be a part of the uh, list of uh, providers of, of information at 17104. Uh, you know, this month, this month is a celebration of Native American heritage. We're celebrating Black Native American heritage. The totality of, of Native American heritage is very, very important. But many people know very little about African Americans uh, and, and their Native American heritage. They know very, very little about that. So we hope to provide to you uh, Native American heritage uh, information. And uh, we're gonna start out uh, and you know, we won't, we won't waste any time with a video and then we'll, we'll have some dialogue on that. Uh, the untold story, the unconquered Seminoles, uh, the, the unconquered Seminoles. You may, you may not know a lot about uh, Seminole Indian uh, people, but we're going to share some information to, to you, and then we're just going to discuss that situation. Uh, many of us know about Seminoles, but they don't know the fact that uh, uh, African Americans were a part of that 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 particular group. Uh, uh, there was a man by the name of, of Osceola, uh, who was one of the leaders uh, of the Seminole. Uh, Indian nation, and he and he uh, married uh, a a black woman. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of things that that transpired uh, in that situation. Uh, my personal situation, just to give you a little bit of uh, background as to why I'm interested. Uh, my grandfather uh, on my mother's side, my paternal grandfather, was a man by the name of Lucius. Amster. Lucius Amster, uh, they say, was half Indian. We knew that he, uh, part of his uh, upbringing was in the Cherokee Nation. Now, many of our folks, and I had a, I have a daughter named uh, Maria Consuelo who did some uh, research, research, and we found out that uh, our people, we thought our people all along were Cherokee. Then we found out that Actually, our people were Sioux, and the Sioux had participated. They were in the Middle West, and they had participated in a war, and they traveled uh, to Georgia, and they were taken in by the Cherokee Indian people. But I have met, and I knew, uh, I never knew my uncle, but he died at a very young young age. I think he was the age of 54 when he, when he passed on. But my wife and I spent time with uh, his sister, Daisy, and there was another uh, sister he had named Roberta. Uh, and we talked to these folks about our Native American heritage. We also had a, a uncle, the brother of my, of my uh, grandfather named Alfred Armster. And he lived uh, in Bristol, New Jersey. He was uh, president of the NAACP in uh, Atlantic City. He was also a uh, pastor of an AME church there. And he also was very much African uh, and Native American. So we have a strong background on my maternal side with Native American blood in it. Uh, uh, for me, I can actually get down to my particular age and you only have a few drops left of Native American blood. I'm not even, uh, let, me, let me clarify, uh, I do have Native American blood, but according to uh, the uh, uh, 23 and me, uh, I am 90% West African. So the Native American blood it was the icing on the cake, but the cake is indeed a chocolate cake. <laughs> and it is, and it is, and it is, it is African. But there was a blending, a coming together 
of these two groups. And they have an interesting joint history. We want you to hear the facts. We want you to, to, to be able to assess for yourself exactly what the situation is. So we're gonna start out and, we're, and then we're gonna have some dialogue. We won't be giving you the total amount of uh, total amount of this video, but we'll give you some of it and then we will, we will review the content. This episode of Untold Stories is underwritten by Baron Collier Jr. Foundation. Tragedy and triumph, survival and success shape the story of the people now known as the Seminoles. Despite three wars to remove these native people from Florida, a small group persevered and today remain the unconquered Seminoles. In the 18th century, after the Spaniards had more or less wiped out all the aboriginal tribes, they came down at different times and different groups. Some even spoke different languages. The whites at the time really didn't understand these different groupings, different tribes, and they applied the term Seminole, basically meant any Indian living in Florida. During their migration into Florida, the Creek Indians perhaps encountered the last remnant of the people Spanish explorers called the Fierce Ones, the Calusa. We still have words in our language, we have songs that our medicine people sing that are Calusa songs. And so we maintain that it was impossible for these entire civilizations just to disappear. Now, were they decimated and damaged over the years and over time? Of course. And we believe that it's those remnants of those peoples and the Creeks that have now formed what we know of as Seminoles. As the Seminoles moved into the Spanish colony of Florida, another group joined with them, runaway slaves. The Seminoles welcomed these people. They were good warriors, and they also were experienced in agriculture because of their years on the plantation. The Seminoles flourished in Florida, farming and amassing large herds of free-ranging cattle, a legacy of early Spanish explorers. By 1817, however, the stage was set for a clash of cultures that would culminate in war. The problem was that the colonists wanted their slaves back. And both the Seminoles across the border and the colonists in Florida were wanting the cattle. And so there was constant strife on the border. And that's really the cause of the first Seminole War. Add to that the fact that Andrew Jackson saw opportunity. It was a Spanish territory that the Spaniards really didn't control. Why not get it for the Americans? And so he did. By the end of the war in 1818, the Seminoles were left in dire straits. The land to which they are banished consists of dry sand ridges and interminable swamps, almost wholly unfit for cultivation. They are now in a starving condition. John Lee Williams. Florida became an American territory in 1821. Although Jackson had successfully forced the Seminoles south, pioneer expansion into the new territory would soon spark the nation's longest and most costly Indian War. The Second Seminole War was a direct result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This law basically said that all Indians living east of the Mississippi would be sent west of the Mississippi. The Seminoles were forced in 1832 to sign a treaty where they would remove out to what is now Oklahoma. They resisted and the Second Seminole War resulted from that resistance. As the Seminoles moved ever deeper into the Everglades, the soldiers were forced to fight another enemy as well, deadly diseases like malaria and typhoid. Public support of the war soon began to wane. Public sentiment began to really turn against the war after Osceola and a number of other chiefs were captured under the white flag of truce. 
he died in prison and became a martyr. A lot of people realized that he was simply a patriot fighting for his home and for his way of life. With disease rampant and soldiers deserting and resigning in record numbers, Major General Thomas Jessup wrote to the Secretary of War, Unless immediate emigration be abandoned, the war will continue for years to come. Is it not worthy of consideration whether this wilderness can even be inhabited by white men? The country is not worth the medicines we shall expend in driving the Indians from it. Jessup's advice was ignored, and by 1842, more than 4,000 Seminoles had been forced from Florida. The government declared the war over, but acknowledged that nearly 400 Seminoles remained in Florida. The war had lasted seven long years and cost nearly $30 million, all for swampland most considered worthless. In 1850, however, the wet wasteland became a potential moneymaker when Congress returned all swamplands to the states for reclamation and development. The new state of Florida now had the right to sell most of the Everglades to settlers, but the Seminoles were in the way. Survey crews began moving into the Everglades. When an army crew destroyed Chief Billy Bowleg's garden in 1855, war erupted again. More than 1,400 soldiers were deployed to fight against an estimated 100 Seminole warriors. Although outnumbered nearly 15 to 1, the Seminoles proved a formidable force. But after nearly three years of fighting, Chief Billy Bowlegs agreed to emigrate to Oklahoma. He and 125 followers sailed from Fort Myers on May 4, 1858. Although the war was declared over, there were still Seminoles in Florida. The government realized that they were never going to get the remainder of them to leave Florida. There were so few of them, they were scattered so widely throughout the Everglades, it was simply a waste of time and money. They never signed a peace treaty because one was never offered to them. They probably wouldn't have signed it anyway, but because the Civil War was coming along, the U.S. basically reduced them to a little over 200 and then left. And that's why the Seminoles are unconquered today. The surviving Seminoles moved deep into the Everglades, but the wars had opened the Florida frontier to ever encroaching white settlement. Although a government report noted in 1875 that little has been known or heard of the Indians since the Seminole Wars, white settlers continued to press for the removal of the Seminoles. An agent was dispatched to see if the Indians would be open to the idea of removal, but the Seminoles refused to hear any Washington talk. By the 1880s, the idea of removal was dropped and an attempt was made to offer the Seminoles individual homesteads instead of reservations. The plan to mainstream the Seminoles failed. The semi-nomadic Seminoles depended on hunting and trapping for their livelihood, and their range was the entire Everglades. One writer warned in 1887, The moving lines of the white population are closing in upon the land of the Seminoles there is no further retreat to which they can go. Soon a great and rapid change must take place. The Seminole is about to enter a future unlike any past he has ever known. Clay Macaulay. Within a few years, Macaulay's prediction was coming true. The first attempt to drain the Everglades was underway and Florida was in the midst of its first land boom. The Seminole's years of isolation were coming to an end. As pioneers moved steadily south, the rich supply of pelts, plumes, and hides in this rugged frontier land spurred the establishment of several trading posts, including George Storter's store in Everglade, Ted Smallwood's store on Chukaluski, and Bill Brown's boat landing deep in the Big Cypress. 
The trading posts were very important to the Seminoles and to survival and success. The trading posts were run by non-Indians, but also pioneers themselves of the Florida terrain. They were able to provide that outlet for Seminoles to make a living for their families. By 1910, however, the heyday years of trade were nearly over. The lucrative plume trade was outlawed, and the hide market was increasingly unstable, the result of systematic drainage of the Everglades. The drainage of the Everglades starting in 1906 in the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach areas was one of those ways that the Everglades was altered for all time for the Seminoles. Right off the bat, the trade routes were cut off. Bill Brown sold the boat landing in 1908, and the Episcopal Church's Glade Cross Mission was moved to the trading post to be closer to the Seminoles. By 1913, the missionary, Dr. W.J. Godden, reported that the Seminoles were facing economic disaster due to the scarcity of game in the Everglades. The draining of the Everglades was almost, for some people, catastrophic. When you live off an environment and you learn to live off of a certain pattern of high water, low water, then no water, it changes a lot, but it also changed the commerce and how Seminole survived. Seminole history is deeply rooted and identity is deeply rooted in this, this pattern of, of um, obstacle and challenge and then survival and success. The Seminole situation spurred the formation of the Seminole Indian Association, founded by several longtime friends of the Seminoles, including W. Stanley Hansen, who would one day be known as the White Medicine Man. Hansen was the son of Dr. William Hansen, a Fort Myers pioneer who began treating the Seminoles in 1884. School child, he would often come home um, from school and there would be Seminole Indian children playing in the yard and, and later became his friends. And my father often said that's probably where he learned his first words, Miccosukee. The new Seminole Indian Association joined other groups in the fight to protect the rights of the Seminoles and to have land set aside for these dispossessed people, even if they didn't want it. Although the federal government had already purchased some land for the Seminoles, their semi-nomadic lifestyle and their distrust of the government doomed the idea of relocation to reservations in the early 20th century. Instead, the Seminoles found other ways to survive. Tourists were fascinated with the colorful Seminoles, and attraction operator Henry Coppinger Sr. shrewdly saw an opportunity to attract more visitors to his tropical gardens in Miami. In 1918, he asked a Seminole family to set up camp at his attraction for the winter season. The Seminole camp was an instant hit, and within a year, another exhibition village was set up at nearby Musa Isle. Although the Seminoles were on exhibit, they continued their normal daily routine, cooking, doing chores, and sewing. By the early 1900s, Seminole women were developing new clothing styles, creating intricate bands of colorful patchwork. The bold and beautiful patchwork became a blazon of tribal identity and an important way for Seminole women to earn extra income for their families. The Seminoles soon added another way to earn money at the tourist villages, alligator wrestling, first developed at the Tropical Gardens by Henry Coppinger Jr. in 1917. You had to ask a Seminole Snake Clan woman for permission to wrestle an alligator because that wasn't something that was done in their culture. The dangerous performances thrilled tourists and the Seminoles became permanently linked to this invented tradition. At the end of the tourist season, the Seminoles returned to their permanent camps in the Everglades and resumed living off the land. But new dredging projects were once again changing the landscape and the Seminoles' way of life. Dredging began in 1915 for the roadbed of the new Tamiami Trail, a cross-state road that would connect Tampa to Miami. By 1923, Baron Gift Collier had taken over construction of the road through the newly named Collier County. Seminoles were hired to help navigate through the wet wilderness 
and Collier's son later recalled, There were many skilled engineers in those days who said building a road through the Everglades couldn't be done. I can tell you this, if my father had not managed to establish very good relations with the Seminole Indians, that road never would have been built. White men with trucks and engineers could build the road, but they couldn't clear the way for the road, and the Indians could. Baron Collier, Jr. The Tamiami Trail opened in 1928. Although the new road destroyed canoe trails and opened the Seminoles' territory to other hunters and developers, the trail also offered a new economic opportunity for the Seminoles. The Tamiami Trail certainly became one of those areas where the Indians literally, and their word for it, is moved out to the road and set up small tourist attractions like the ones they had already been in since 1917 in Miami so that they could control their own destiny by being entrepreneurs, setting up their own little tourist attractions with maybe a small zoo, doing maybe a little alligator wrestling, and having crafts they could sell to the tourists. By 1930, an estimated 300 Seminoles, more than half of the population, were involved in the tourist attraction business. Although the Seminoles were surviving, the Depression was taking its toll and W. Stanley Hansen reported to the Seminole Indian Association in 1931 that the Indians are willing to accept aid for the first time in their history. The Seminoles' precarious economic situation was complicated by the fact that most were squatters and had no right to the land they were living on. After years of resistance, some Seminole families agreed to move to one of the three reservations established by the government. Even reservation lands, however, were threatened. My grandfather was successful in working with Senator Gomez to stop what was called a Blanchard Bill that would have allowed oil excavation speculation in the Big Sarpsis Reservation. He stated in his letter, um, how many times are you going to promise something to these people and then take it away? To help encourage economic development on the reservations, a report to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs recommended, We, the representatives of the civilization that drove the Seminole out of the cattle business, have got to start at the very beginning and remake him into a cattleman. Roy Nash. The federal government's Depression-era New Deal programs eventually helped the Seminoles return to successful, large-scale cattle ranching. Although the reservations offered increasing economic opportunities, many Seminoles, especially those living along the Tamiami Trail, refused to move to the reservations. Their tourist villages, however, were increasingly seen as a demeaning livelihood by both the government and an outspoken missionary named Deaconess Harriet Bedell. Bedell visited South Florida in 1932 and was appalled by the tourist villages along the Tamiami Trail. She said, this is simply disgusting. This is treating people like animals, like, like a zoo. You cannot do this to human beings. Bedell reactivated the defunct Glade Cross mission and made her headquarters in Everglades, close to the Tamiami Trail Seminoles. Despite her strong objection to the tourist villages, however, the businesses continued. She you know, did not want to see the small Indians sell out, so to speak, on their, on their culture. My grandfather, along with Cory Osceola, Josie Billy, and Ingram Billy, basically were of the opinion that we're going to do what we got to do to eat. Although the deaconess made little headway against the tourist villages, she eventually befriended some of the Seminoles and became a champion of their colorful crafts. She went out there and helped them as much as she could. She would take medicines, she would take food. Little by little, they began to trust this crazy lady who came out in her navy blue clothes. The deaconess bought crafts from the Seminoles and marketed them, both locally and nationally, but the promising cottage industry was soon threatened by an unlikely source, overseas competition. The Japanese were copying American native crafts, and they were selling them all over the United States very cheaply. They were undercutting the Indian tribes, and Harriet pitched such a fit about this that she went to Washington, D.C. 
And she caused so much commotion that they passed a law saying that we could not import Japanese copies of American native artifacts anymore. The Deaconess also worked with the Seminole Indian Association to develop a trademark label that certified genuine Seminole products. By the mid-1930s, the Seminoles' lands were threatened once again as plans were unveiled for the new Everglades National Park. Although reservation lands within the new park boundary were exchanged for more acreage abutting the Big Cypress Reservation, the new park meant the loss of traditional hunting areas. The situation prompted an historic meeting with Florida Governor David Schultz in 1936. It was actually billed as the first time that the Seminoles agreed to meet with a government official. He wanted to be given a cash figure or services that the state could provide, but my grandfather and the other men that were representing the, the tribal people at the time said, we just want to be left alone. The governor later told reporters, they say they fear the white men will keep moving them until they are in the water. That was the expression they used. By the late 1940s, the Seminoles' fears were justified once again as they faced another serious threat from the government. After World War II, they were trying to look around and see what finances could be cut. And one of the things that the U.S. government looked at were the Indians and Indian reservations. And they thought, well, why don't we just try to mainstream these people and um, terminate them as Indians? With the threat of losing their identity and their sovereign rights as an Indian nation, the Seminoles organized and became the Seminole Tribe of Florida in 1957. Not all of the Seminoles, however, wanted to be included in the new federally recognized tribe. The government realized that there was another tribe, some people who were ideologically and politically separate from the Seminoles. That was the people along the Tamiami Trail who came to be known as the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida, and they organized in 1962. Culturally, the Seminole tribe shares a language with the Miccosukees, shares a clan system with the Miccosukees, but the Seminoles also have um, another language, and that's the Creek language, the original Creek language. Most of the Seminoles and Miccosukees continued in the tourism business until the 1970s, when a novel idea took advantage of the tax-free status of the reservations and transformed the impoverished tribes. Leaders at the time that began to look at tax-free tobacco products, and if you don't charge sales tax to that end user, at the end of the day, you're going to make a significant amount of money. Smoke shops opened on our reservations and then around the country. By the late 1970s, the Seminoles had introduced another innovative enterprise that took advantage of their sovereign rights on reservation lands, high-stakes bingo. Indian gaming, as we know it today, was started because of a single bingo game and the installation of a bingo facility on the Hollywood Indian Reservation. So the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, we consider ourselves, you know, the grandmother of gaming. We gave birth to it. The tribe opened a large corporate headquarters building on the Hollywood Reservation and reinvested its increasing income in other ventures, including ecotourism and agriculture knowing that the lucrative smoke shops and gaming could one day be revoked by a high court ruling. There's always going to be a battle over the tax status of tribes. And I think most Native people believe that there's a daily fight to stop Indian gaming. And that's why I say, you know, you ask a Seminole, and most of us will all say the same thing, that the war's never ended, because we know that they're still going on. They're just being held on a different type of battlefield. Fifty years after federal recognition, the Seminole Tribe of Florida was one of the most successful American Indian tribes in the country, and the billion-dollar corporation was about to make headlines again. As of December 7, 2006, they bought the rank groups, hard rock, hotels, and casino that are worldwide. And as Councilman Max Osceola said, the sun will never set on the Seminoles' hard rock. There are a lot of people that wonder about all this money that the Seminoles are amassing. The great thing about their new economic ventures 
is that with those funds, they can remain Seminole and Miccosukee. They don't have to worry anymore about are they going to survive? So all of this money is a very good thing for these tribal people. It will actually help them remain who they are. The legacy and probably the great irony of the Seminole Wars is if we hadn't fought these wars, if we hadn't put so much pressure on these people, driven them down into the Everglades, the Seminole culture might very well have just disappeared. By forcing them into these situations, they held on to that identity and that culture. You have to respect that and you have to be somewhat. This program was produced for the citizens of That'll give you a, a foundation for, of information uh, about the Seminole Indians. Uh, and let's do some clarif clarification uh, about who the Seminole Indians were. Uh, and also uh, integrate uh, who my folks were. First of all, uh, I, my, my people come from Southwest Georgia and the area known as Southwest Georgia at, at one at one one time was the uh was the uh, creek indian nation and this was creek indian nation as a matter of fact they had uh government systems they had written that language people talk about these indians as if they were uh, as, if, as if they were uncivilized and then they were not able or capable uh, of handling their own affairs their own business uh these creeks also had slaves and African slaves. And all of this uh, came with their relationships with Europeans. Uh, the British at that time uh, were in control of uh, They kind of used Georgia as a penal institution. Uh, and many uh, prisoners from uh, England were shipped to Georgia uh, in, in, in prisons. Uh, so they had people who were indentured servants. Uh, the only diff the difference between uh, African slavery, slaves and indentured servants is that the indentured servants was temporary. And once they served their term, then they were released. Now on the flip side of that with the uh, a Creek Indian Nation and a part, and the Creek Indian Nation was a, was a combination of several different tribes and eth eth ethnic groups. So they weren't just one people and one, uh, one, one, one ethnic group, a part of that were the Cherokee Indians. Uh, and also two Indians were, uh, were, were in that. And my, my folks were uh, des are descendants of Sioux Indians uh, that traveled from actually uh, the Midwest, from Indiana, uh, they were involved in wars there. And they came to Georgia. They set up, they set up living in Georgia. So that was where it was. But still, uh, you had the same kind of encroachment from Europeans that eventually wanted to take over the land that belonged to the Native Americans in in, in Georgia. Uh, you also also had uh, individuals, uh, slaves that were enslaved. That wanted to escape these plantations. I know in my area was known in, uh, and that's Thomas County, Georgia, was known for huge uh, plantations. Uh, as a matter of fact, and also we, it was a right wing uh, activity that existed uh, where I'm located, uh, where I was located, and where I was where I was born. I was born in a small community called Spring Hill, Georgia, which is a maybe a couple of miles outside of Thomasville. Georgia. Uh, and, you know, all of this was Indian land. Uh, but we had the same racism, the same discrimination, uh, slavery, the people were enslaved. Now, we were enslaved on both ends. We were not only enslaved by uh, the, the, the British, but even some of the Native Americans enslaved. Now, it was kind of a different kind of thing. Uh, at least on the Native American side, we were considered human beings. And even though we, we uh, were slaves, 
we also were, were, were people that came in and they and they and they intermarried with the slave. Uh, you find a lot of race mixing that, that, that occurred uh, between the slaves and the Native American. And not only that, between also the whites. So we, you got people who lived in this particular area that we have Native American blood, may have Caucasian blood. Uh, also, they would use uh, uh, our women as their play toys. When a, when a, when a man owns a woman and, and that woman is considered a chattel, uh, then whatever he wants to do, he does what he want, wants, to, wants to do. But, and the, it was a style of life slavery that was really humiliating. Uh, they treated that you as if you were a chattel and less than human being. Uh, and, and not all the Indians were, 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 were great. Uh, like I said, even though they intermarried and, and, they, and, and there was relationship, there were still problems there. So quite often our, our people would escape uh, to Florida. Now, then you had in Florida, you had the Seminole right there. And who were the Seminole? Where did they come from? Now, if you, if you listen to it and you talk to different historians, you'll get different points of view. Uh, one is the Seminoles, uh, natives uh, were, were, were different ethnic groups, uh, so-called Native Americans, uh, Afri Africans also, and some of the Africans are Native, Native Americans. Uh, they were part, part of that, that collection of individuals. And then I've just recently learned that some of the Dulles and the Geechee of South Carolina also drifted down through Georgia and into and, and Florida. Now, it was uh, North Florida uh, is where closest to where I, I was born. Uh, I was born and my, my people came from an uh, area uh, known as Thomasville that was 38 miles uh, north of Tallahassee, Florida. Okay. So, and they drifted down into the state of Florida. Uh, some of these this videos, uh, and I'm, I'm sitting back and listening and learning also uh, because, uh, I don't know, they say that, 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 that we were, we were uh, uh, living in swamps. I mean, when we, I'm talking about the Seminoles. And, uh, but, you know, they adapted to the area in which they live. Uh, they, they raised cattle, they raised crops. And uh, also they got involved in some, some confrontations with, with the government. And so we, we, we're gonna go ahead and play this next, this next video for you. Uh, there was, uh, and uh, it will give you some information about what happened with African-Americans in Southwest Georgia. We'll take a look at it. Welcome to The Black Excellence and Abundance Channel. The Black Seminoles are a group of the Gullah Geechee who escaped from the rice plantations in South Carolina and Georgia. They built their own settlements on the Florida frontier, fought a series of wars for over a hundred year period to preserve their freedom and were scattered across North America. They have played a significant role in the emancipation of the slaves, but have never received the recognition they deserve. Some Gullah slaves managed to escape from coastal South Carolina and Georgia south into the Florida Peninsula. The Gullahs were establishing their own free settlements in the Florida wilderness as early as the late 1700s. They built separate villages of thatched roof houses surrounded by fields of corn and swamp rice and they maintain friendly relations with the mixed population of refugee Indians. Thatched roof is a very old roofing method and has been used in both tropical and temperate climates. In time, the two groups came to view themselves as parts of the same tribe in which blacks held important positions of leadership. In 1738, the newly freed black men and women established the town of Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose which was the first black town established in North America. Good, 
This black land was a place the slaves would escape to have their own land and a place to have military training. Although they were not given credit for it, the so-called Indian War was actually the Gullah Wars. The Gullahs were physically more suited to the tropical climate and possessed an indispensable knowledge of tropical agriculture, and without their assistance, the Indians would not have been able to cope effectively with the Florida environment. There were skirmishes in 1812 and 1816. In 1818, General Andrew Jackson led an American army into Florida to claim it for the United States, and a war finally erupted. The blacks and Indians fought side by side in a desperate struggle to stop the American advance. In 1835, the Second Seminole War broke out and this full-scale guerrilla war would last for six years and claim the lives of 1,500 American soldiers. The black Seminoles waged the fiercest resistance as they feared that capture or surrender meant death or return to slavery. And they were more adept at living and fighting in the jungles than their Indian comrades. These men were literally fighting for their lives and the lives of their families and friends. They were true freedom fighters and they felt like they would die before they went back into captivity. Two of the great leaders of note of these wars is Osceola and John Horse. In addition to aiding the natives in their fight, Black Seminoles recruited plantation slaves to rebellion at the start of the war. Together, these forces were responsible for the destruction of 21 sugar plantations from Christmas Day, December 25, 1835, through the summer of 1836. They scared the daylights out of the plantation owners and those who sought to continue to oppress them. They were very instrumental in ending slavery. The American commander, General Jessup, informed the War Department that this, you may be assured, is a Negro and not an Indian war. And a U.S. congressman of the period commented that these black fighters were contending against the whole military power of the United States. When the army finally captured the black Seminoles, officers refused to return them to slavery, fearing that these seasoned warriors accustomed to their freedom would wreak havoc on the southern plantations. In 1842, the army forcibly removed them, along with their Indian comrades, to Indian territory, now Oklahoma, in the unsettled west. The black Seminoles, exiled from their Florida strongholds, were forced to continue their struggle for freedom on the western frontier. In Oklahoma, the government attempted to put them under the authority of the Creek Indian slave owners who tried to curb their freedom and white slave traders came at night to kidnap their women and children. In 1850, a group of black Seminoles and Seminole Indians escaped south across Texas to the desert badlands of northern Mexico. They established a free settlement and as in Florida, began to attract runaway slaves from across the border. We are always taught that blacks enslaved in this country fled north for freedom. However, very rarely do we hear that they also fled south, as far as Mexico. In 1855, a heavily armed band of Texas Rangers rode into Mexico to destroy the Seminole settlement, but they got a rude awakening when they were stopped in their tracks by the Black Seminoles and forced back into the U.S. Many of the Geechees returned to Oklahoma, and some of the Black Seminoles remained in Mexico, fighting constantly to protect their settlement from outside forces. 
the descendants of the Black Seminoles remain in Mexico to this day. In 1870, after the emancipation of the slaves in the United States, the U.S. Cavalry in Southern Texas invited some of the Black Seminoles to return and join the Army, and it officially established the Seminole Negro Indian Scouts. In 1875, Three of the Scouts won the Congressional Medal of Honor, America's highest military decoration in a single engagement. The Black Seminoles had fled the rice plantations, built their own free settlements in Florida wilderness, and then fought almost continuously for over 100 years to preserve their freedom. If the truth be told, it is no surprise that these men made some of the finest soldiers that this country has ever produced. Today, there are still Black Seminole communities scattered across North America and the West Indies. The Black Indians live on the Andros Islands in the Bahamas. The Seminole Freedmen, the largest group, live in rural Seminole County, Oklahoma, where they are still official members of the Seminole Indian Nation. The Mascago dwell in the desert town of Nascimiento in the state of Coahuila in northern Mexico. All have roots and ties to the Black Seminoles and the Gullah Geechee. These wars were fought for over 100 years, and the Gullah Geechee Black Seminole do not get the credit that they deserve in helping to end the system of slavery. They put a fear in the society that let them know that they would die rather than go back into captivity. The Black Excellence and Abundance. That's facts. And hey, I'm still here listening and learning also. Uh, the Gullahs or, or Geechees, uh, um, basically uh, from West Africa, uh, from Sierra Leone and Liberia, they settled off the coast of, of, uh, uh, of, of Charleston. Uh, now uh, you find out you know, they travel and then they were in Oklahoma, they were in in in, in Florida. Uh, I know about this the, the uh, settlements and the blacks that escaped uh, slavery and, and went into Mex Mexico. Uh, one of the presidents of Mexico was was a was, was a mixed origin and had slave ancestors and freed and freed the slaves. Uh, and we know that right now we've done some shows that show that there were a development uh, in uh, Mexico of uh, cities, locations uh, that are predominantly black uh, throughout. And we know there's a museum and we showed pictures of that where there, there are stone, big stone mass of, of, of Af Africans. But getting back to uh, uh, the Gullahs, and the the Gishi names uh, coming together with the with the Seminoles and fighting the resistance. Andrew Jackson uh, was a racist scoundrel who became president of the United United States, and he was anti Native American and did everything he can. And and somehow these people with their racist self think they have a right to come into someone else's land uh, and, and territory and just take it. And do what they want with them, and 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 not understand that people were. Some some people, uh, the old saying: Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And people fought. People didn't just take it; 
we were told earlier that, hey, the blacks didn't resist slavery, that they just succumbed. But that's not, that's not true. No human being uh, wants to be enslaved, no matter whether they're white, whether they're black, uh, it, it does, uh, whether they're Native American or whether or not they're Asian, they, they will resist slavery. Uh, and that's exactly what was happening with the Gitche uh, people. Now, in some cases, we had uh, uh, the creation of, uh, of, of uh, army units and uh, Blacks that went into the army uh, under white leadership. Uh, they had uh, what they call uh, the Buffalo Soldiers who fought alongside uh, their white compatriots uh, against Native Americans, that happened. Uh, that wasn't an entire community, but that was some individuals that, that did that. And, uh, and also uh, we learned that they received uh, some recognition, but they also, I'm sure, were black. And so they had, <laughs> and considering uh, the nature of things and how people are being treated, I'm sure they, they were not treated with any type of justice uh, and equal, equal, equality. Uh, so yeah, this is Native American Heritage Month. And we want to lift up our voices in recognition and, and praise for all Native American people, including indigenous Black people. Uh, and we know, and we've said it over and over again, that the original uh, man was black uh, and came out of Africa and spread throughout the world. And that's thousands of years ago. Uh, but all people, regardless of their race, creed, or, or color, uh, have got to be treated uh, in a just fashion and an equal fashion. That's why I believe that people need to learn how to love each other. War is no way. Uh, and this is this is me speaking of selling issues and problems between individuals. I don't care what they've done in the past. Uh, Martin Luther King had something that I didn't understand as a kid. Uh, he used a philosophy of nonviolence. He did not believe in war. He believed in peace and justice and equality among all all, all people. Uh, but you need to know your past so you won't repeat it. You need to know exactly what happened to your people so you don't repeat it. But that doesn't mean that you need to carry hate in your heart for anybody. I don't care who they are. I don't care what they've done. Because hate is a two-edged sword. And it not only cuts the person that you're hating, it cuts the person that's doing the, doing the hating. And so that's, that's where I'm at. Uh, and I present this information to you not to build up any animosity among folks, but just to let people know the history, the history, know the true stories of what happened years ago. So we will begin to start doing things and uh, that, that will, shall say, preserve our nation rather than destroy our nation. Uh, we had uh, an, uh, an election on November 8th. And we've had some, and I'm very pleased with some of the good people that have been placed in the office, particularly in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We've had some wonderful people that have been placed. And I'm looking for great things and I'm looking to work. I, I by the way, worked in government for many years. Most of my, my life, I was involved in government. I had the privilege of working for Governor uh, Robert B. Casey, who I think is one of the greatest uh, Pennsylvania governors that live. And I'll say that the man was strong on civil rights and equal opportunity. Uh, he was a man that was a religious man. And his son is, is, is one of the greatest senators that ever lived, as uh, Robert B. Casey Jr., who was the current senator. And now we have another gentleman, Fred Fellman, uh, who was just, just elected. I think we're truly blessed to have people of those caliber. And uh, we're still waiting to see what happens in Georgia. Uh, Herschel the Fool uh, Walker is running, is, is running, saying some some ridiculous ridiculous things. I'm hoping that he does not win in, in Georgia, my home state. 
So it's not over. It's not, not over until they say the fat lady sings, and that's going to happen. Uh, getting down near the end, want to again remind you that we are still in business. Uh, we're still down at the Lebanon Valley Farmers, Farmers Market, uh, African Paradise. Uh, we've, we've had quite a bit of uh, shipment of, we have new drums, we have new clothing. Uh, come down and see us, 35 South, uh, South 8th, 8th, 8th Street. And here, here we are, all uh, four foot tall gir giraffes, original, original uh, oil paintings. Uh, stat stat statues, soaps. Uh, we have uh, we and we and we welcome you. We welcome everybody. I've I've had wives ask me, can 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 they buy this this stuff? Uh, hey, everybody's welcome. Please come, no matter what your ethnicity is, and join us and say and, and say hello. Uh, please do that. Do do that. Do that for me. Uh, we have a one. We're under new own ownership down there. Wonderful uh, people, and they're trying to bring in some some new uh, vendors. And they've brought in new, new vendors. As a matter, matter of fact, they're trying to expand and uh, and do that. We have okay. I mean, we got uh, a food court. There's three three stores. We have a mezzanine. We have a Japanese food. We have uh, Greek Greek food. We have poultry uh we have uh, uh and there's a bar and grill on the third floor so come on down and join us and, and have a good time uh we look forward we look forward to seeing you uh native american heritage that's what that's what we were doing this this this, this month i hope you picked up something i hope you learned something that you didn't know and, 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 and spark your interest uh, check out uh, YouTube and some of the uh, videos that they have on YouTube. Uh, read something also. Check out Facebook. Learn what you learn what you can about uh, Native American culture. It's really really interesting. Uh, uh, music, uh, the uh, the history of it, and uh, it's not as barbaric as some people like uh, uh, think it is. Uh, it's interesting, and it's uh, and there's a lot to be said for Native American culture. Uh, and there's also the similarities between cultures. Uh, cultures have standards. They have religions. They have they have uh, have 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 you know they have uh, things that they have to present to society. And the Indians, the Indians, are Native American people are no no different. Uh, we all we all people. We're all just human beings trying to be trying to be free. Uh, so we want you to do uh, continue to join us. We look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, I want to say to you, to you, thanks again for for being with us. Uh, uh, we understand we're going to have a celebration of uh, one seven one zero four. The boys have has been uh, doing things uh, with us and for us, and. Uh, we appreciate all the things we've done and all the uh, uh, individuals that come in. And hey, the good thing about being online and, and having Facebook and all that is that this broadcast is, is heard throughout the world. And I talk to my relatives in different parts of the country that listen to, listen to the show and look at the show. So tell somebody else about it, okay? Uh, tune us in. And if you want to do a show of your own, then contact. Chris Thomas and uh, the Thomas family, and uh, talk to them about it. Uh, you have something in quality that you want, you want you want to share. Go ahead and do that. Share that information and get it get it done. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to sign off now. Uh, and thanks again for tuning in. Uh, I want to hear from you. Uh, I want to see you. Uh, we'll see you again and talk to you again next week, Tuesday between 1.30 and 2.30. Take care. Richard James, signing off. <laughs>
So listen, let us hear from you sometime also. So this is your neighbor and your friend signing off. Until I see you again next week, and hear from you again next week. So long. God bless.